Well, good morning and welcome to The Bridge. Welcome to our continuing of the series entitled Be Holy as we're walking through the book of Leviticus. I want to ask you if you would to pray with me as we begin this morning. Lord, I come to you now and I ask you on behalf of this people that you prepare our hearts to hear from you. Lord, that every single person within the sound of my voice, those here in a movie theater in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, those sitting in a church building in an industrial park on Kent Island, those that are gathered around the family in Kampala, Uganda, those that may be now in their villages outside of Kerala, India, those in Stockholm, Sweden, brothers and sisters in six different locations across Kenya, and every other child of God or curious seeker, hearing my voice either live or or at another time through the recording of this message. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, will come and change each and every one of us, starting with me, that we would be a more pure representation of your passion, your promises, and your purposes as your people and it's in jesus name i pray amen and amen well i want to ask you a question as we continue in the book of leviticus looking at chapters 11 through 15 today surveying this section of the scriptures i want to ask you a question that will seem obvious before we're done you ready here's my question i actually have a handful first question is this what part of the Bible's teaching do you personally believe to be toughest to swallow? What would you say is the toughest part of the Bible's teaching? If you look through the entire scriptures, would you say perhaps it's right at the very beginning. I struggle with this whole idea that in the beginning God created. Maybe you've got a mind that struggles with the reality of creator God. Maybe you find the Proverbs to be difficult as they apply their principles to you. Things like, lean not on your own understanding, but follow the Lord and watch as He makes your path straight. Perhaps you struggle with the whole idea of God's position on sexuality. Where do you struggle? What do you find to be the toughest teaching in all the Bible? Maybe it's in the New Testament with some of the epistles where you read God speaking through his followers, telling us that we are to literally lay down our lives, that we are to truly champion the declaring of sound teaching. That's Titus 2.1, that you and I are to declare these things which are in accord with sound teaching. Maybe you struggle with the reality of needing to put on spiritual warfare's defense system, which is God's armor. I want to ask you, where do you struggle? What is the hardest teaching in the Bible to you? How about this? Which of Christ's commands personally rub you wrong? Where's your Achilles heel when it comes to surrendering and submitting to Christ's commands? This whole idea of loving your enemy? How about picking up your cross daily and following him? How about this idea that you're not to judge superficially, but believe it or not, Christian, you've been called, John 7, 24, you've been called to judge people righteously. Where do you struggle? Let me ask you a third question. What do you make of those people who seem to be so obsessed with obedience in the scriptures. What do you make of those people in the here and now? Say a pastor, Jeff, who seems to be so obsessed with biblical obedience. Question four, might there be a difference? Could you see a difference between the pursuit of pharisaical perfectionism and the God-honoring pursuit of Christ-like purity? Do you see the difference between the two? 
Now this will all become relevant, I pray, before we're done, because these questions are directly related to the principles of the book of Leviticus. Do you know that scholars will tell you that the number one reason that people give for having stopped trying to read through the Bible is the book of Leviticus. They'll tell you that the book of Leviticus has stopped more people who have started to read through the Bible than anything else. They would say it's the toughest place in the Bible to get through. Some would say, I don't like what it says. Some would tell you that it's just too darn particular and picky -yoon. Well, I want you to know that if you were to look closely at the book of Leviticus and ask people, where in Leviticus did you actually stop? We're going to come to the section of Scripture today that I think stops most people that stop in the book of Leviticus. When you look at Leviticus chapter 11 through 15, most people don't get what God is really saying. And my prayer is that today, you and I, as we continue through the book of Leviticus, we're going to get it. We're not just going to get it, we're going to own it. And we're not just going to own it, we're going to champion it with the joy of our Lord. Amen? Now, let me just remind you before we go forward, the book of Leviticus, that so many think is a list of laws, is not that at all. It's a blueprint for a love affair with Almighty God and His fallen people. It's the blueprint that tells us two things. God is recruiting and God is reconciling His people. He's recruiting those that will be His. He's making it clear, I want you to be my people. I'm going to reconcile you to myself. And here's the plan. And as our loving God would do, he gives us some options. My prayer is that you'll see today the fork in the road where you and I have some choice and some responsibility. It's at the heart of faithful obedience. That God is reconciling and recruiting and using his call to holiness, which is just another word for faithful obedience, to determine who will be on his team. You see, in the Old Testament, faithful obedience is what God used to call people to himself. And today, in the New Testament truths, it's faithful obedience that God uses to prove that people have come to him. So in the Old Testament, it's the calling of faithful obedience. In the New Testament, it's the sending out in faithful obedience. Now, for some, no doubt, there's a question here because you've not been with us to this point through Leviticus, and maybe you're not familiar with chapters 11 through 15 of Leviticus. So let me take a little bit of time here this morning and just give you a survey and an overview. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page moving forward. And if you are familiar with Leviticus 11 through 15, I promise you that you're about to get the unexpected. And in the same breath, I promise you, you're about to get the heart of God. You're about to get the biblical application of this portion of Scripture. Now, each of the five chapters begin with, and this shouldn't surprise you if you've been with us, and God spoke and God spoke, and God spoke, and God spoke, and God spoke. And in chapter 11, he spoke to what many people would say, oh, that's the dietary laws. He spoke, that's God's laws on the delicacies of which human or which living things you can and cannot eat. Well, I want you to know that Leviticus chapter 11 has a lot more to do with faith than it does food. If you go and you look at Leviticus chapter 12, a very short chapter, many would say, oh, that's where it's God's law on the deliveries, on childbirth. I want you to know that Leviticus 12 has a lot more to do with believing than it does babies. And if you look at chapters 13 and 14, you'll see what appears to be God's law in focus on diseases. And I want you to know Leviticus 13 and 14 has a lot more to do with how we live than what it is to live with leprosy. And when you go to chapter 15 of Leviticus, where it appears that the focus is on God's law and bodily discharges, 
intimate human sexual fluids? I want you to know that Leviticus 15 has a lot more to do with discipleship than discharges. This is the point. We've got to grab the principles that are here. And so I want to give you the big idea. When you look at Leviticus 11 through 15, here's the big idea. God is recruiting and reconciling. And in so doing, he's making sure that we understand that how people come to the Lord and how people go for the Lord matters. How people come to him for salvation and purification But even today, even in this context, and I say to you as Pastor Charlie did this morning in the worship set, don't come to church to be in a social gathering. Come to worship our King, that how we come to the Lord matters. Our focus, our faith, our core desire should be to worship Him. How we come to the Lord and how we go for the Lord matters. So much so that God is laying down a pattern. And there are five things that I pray that you will see at the principal level that undergird these particulars. That faithful obedience, our call to be holy. And again, to be holy is to be faithfully obedient. I pray that you'll understand why people like me do obsess over faithful obedience biblically because this is the call to be holy. This is what our Lord has called us to be. I, the Lord your God, am holy. Therefore, be holy. It's repeated again and again and again, Old Testament and New Testament. But see this, that the call to faithful obedience, it serves as the standard, the invitation, the test, the witness, and the greatest blessing that we have to represent God's grace and God's holiness. Not only that, but when you look at faithful obedience, it serves as our standard, our invitation, our test, our witness, and our blessing when it reflects our genuine love for the Lord. So it's faithful obedience that creates the intersection where the rubber hits the road, where where the true believer demonstrates a belief that brings glory to God. Remember, it was last week that I said to you that it's God's holiness, as we see here in Leviticus and also throughout the Scriptures, that is describing God's way and declaring God's warning. It's the both and. I want you to hear one verse to begin that encapsulates this entire portion of Scripture. It's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 44. And I say to you, while there are five chapters here of God's Word, here's one verse that gives you the principled understanding and application of the whole thing. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate or set apart yourselves. You are to set yourself apart. How? By being holy. What does that mean? Faithful obedience to the standards of God. As laid out in his word. God's word, God's will, God's way. This is the call. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate or set apart yourselves, therefore, and be holy. For I am holy. Do not, do not defile yourselves. Remember last week? Do not profane. Thirteen times in chapters 21 and 22. Don't you profane my name. Don't you profane. Here he says, do not defile. Be holy, for I am holy. Do not defile. Well, let me tell you, nothing defiles like disobedience. Nothing defiles like disobedience. In fact, I would say to you that disobedience embodies defilement. It's where disobedience and defilement live together. And it comes as a profaning, as a disrespecting, as a disobedient expression of the heart. 
And our Lord has said, I am worth all of your worship. And I am calling you to a standard. You see, you're not just coming to me, but if you come to me, you're going to go for me. And therefore, you need to learn up front that my standard is absolute total faithful obedience 99 percent obedience is 100 percent disobedience well i don't know that i like that well you ought to talk to the priest that god dropped dead right there in the temple consumed them by fire because they decided to do things their own way this is god's standard and this is what he's teaching in fact if you go to the end of the passage leviticus 15 31 you're going to see a similar echoing truth Again, God's word. You must keep the Israelites separate from the things that defile them. You must keep my people separate from the things that defile them or make them unclean. Why? So that they will not die in their uncleanness. Well, why would they die in their uncleanness, Lord? He tells us, for defiling my dwelling place, my tabernacle, which is among them. You see, this is to save the lives of people who think that they can be religious and not need to repent and come into a redeemed restoration with our Lord. This is God's love. He's telling us, you've got to understand my call to my standards. You can't come to me on your terms. You must come on my terms. I love you too much to leave you out there in the midst of the ambiguous. Now, I pray for those of you that call the bridge home that perhaps hearing these truths applied through another voice, another Pastor Jeff. I want to introduce you now to Pastor Jeff Durbin from Salt Lake City, Utah. And you're going to say, hey, these two guys, Pastor Jeff and Pastor Jeff, these are two brothers from a different mother. And that's true because we got the same dad. And we've been given the same playbook. I pray that as you hear this, that you will accept God speaking to you. This is not about food. You don't need to worry about what's on the menu. You need to surrender to our Messiah. This whole portion of Scripture is to calibrate our hearts to understand and accept that our Lord is Lord. He's not to be negotiated with. And His Word is rock solid. Watch this and I pray, be blessed as you understand the call to accept God's standards and put them into application today. Let's start with a a prayer, and then we'll get right into today, guys. Let's pray. Father, I want to pray, Lord, that you would get me out of the way right now. God, I pray that you would have your hand heavy on us right now, Lord. I, I pray that you would convict us, challenge us, God, overwhelm us with a sense, God, of your glory of your majesty, of your power, Lord, and above all, Lord, let us sense, Lord, the real beauty of the good news, God, your gospel. And I pray, Lord, that you would cause us, Lord, to repent of our indifference to the world. Call us, Lord, in this service today, God, to a new way. Lord, have us abandon love of comfort love of self, love of reputation, cause us to, Lord, allow this world to just flee from us so that we prize you, Lord, above all and your gospel above all. I pray, Lord, that you would smash, Lord, our attachment to the things of this world, Lord. Have us set our eyes on the things that are above, Lord, not on the things that are below. Let us, Lord, live lives of missionary sacrifice, God. I pray that you would allow the world to see in us, God, that you are our treasure, that you are to be pursued, that you are the one that we seek and the world should seek. Put your gospel on our lips, God. Let it be fire in our mouths and let the world be wood. In Jesus' name, amen. If you go to your Bibles, I'm going to really get right into it. Romans chapter 1, 
is, is at least a place to start talking today. Romans chapter 1. The Apostle Paul to the church in Rome, just a little background, he doesn't know this church. He has really, ultimately, we don't know, he didn't have anything necessarily to do with the, the church in, in Rome. It, it starting it planning and growing it, pastoring it. Um, he says in the text, he says that your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Consider that for a second. First century, relatively quickly after the resurrection of Jesus, the Apostle Paul, once an antagonist towards the faith, says to this church in Rome, your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. That's first century. That's not long after the resurrection of the Messiah, the promised Messiah, raised from the dead and ascended, seated at the right hand of the Father, King of kings, Lord of lords. The most popular verse quoted from the Old Testament in the New Testament was from the psalm, Psalm 110.1. Paul makes reference to it, about Jesus. He must reign until all his enemies are a footstool for his feet. And the apostle Paul sees that that's where we're going in history, and so he says to the church in Rome, first century, he says, your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. And I have to ask us a question in the 21st century, as pastors, up and coming pastors and leaders, I gotta ask us a question what has happened to us? What's going on with the church today in the West? We have fallen. We are all but irrelevant to the culture. And I have to ask the question as a pastor I have to ask the question is the Holy Spirit not powerful? Is God not able to open the eyes of blind people and raise the dead any longer? Is that a first century thing that God was able to smash? pagan cultures, and literally turn the world upside down in the first century after the resurrection, but he can't do it now? Is the gospel no longer relevant? Was it relevant for people then but not now? What's happened to us as a church? That we could say in the first century the gospel is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Everybody's talking about you and your faith. Same gospel, same God, same power, same Savior who raises the dead. Amen? And what's happened to us as a church today in our culture? The church grows today in the most persecuted parts of the world. And America is almost not even on the map of church growth. What's happened to us? Is it the gospel itself? It's lost its power. It's lost its relevance. Is God no longer able to save and raise the dead? So Paul says in Romans, your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. That's verse 8. But he opens up, and this is the message I want to talk about today. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the good news of God. Hold on to that. The Bible calls it the gospel. The Bible calls it the gospel of the kingdom. But in this text, Paul says that it's God's good news. It's good news from the Creator, God, the one and only, the first, the last, the transcendent one, the one who is not dependent, the infinite one, the holy one, condescended, and He has good news for the world. This is not a suggestion. It's God, the Creator of all things, the one who sustains you right now as you sit, the one who actually holds your breath in His hands. That last breath that you took and I took was borrowed from Him. He sustains us at this very moment. This is his good news. Paul says, called as an apostle, set apart for the good news of God. It's God's good news. Now, this is what you want to get. He says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And notice what he says here. I want you to follow the text here. You have to see how Paul's vision is and how our vision has not been. He says, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. You see, here's the story. You need to get this. When we talk about the good news the good news is not, is absolutely not a suggestion to the world. It's not. The good news is not good advice. The good news is not Jesus asking you to give him a chance or a try. Paul says that he's called with this gospel for God 
to bring about the obedience of faith among all the nations. And then he says to Rome, he says to you, he says, your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. And this gospel is not something dropped into history as a novelty. You need to know that you and I sitting in this room today are in fact testimonies of God's covenant faithfulness. You're sitting in this room right now, many of us, the descendants of pagan parents, not Jewish by descent. And we sit in a long line of prophetic fulfillment. You are a testimony of God's covenant faithfulness. God promised in the scriptures beforehand that God was going to send a Messiah. Genesis 49.10, Moses says that Shiloh is going to come and to him is going to be the obedience of the nations. God promised Messiah was going to come, a king was coming, and he was bringing a kingdom. The Psalms give you all this testimony of this Messiah who's coming. Psalm 2, God says to the Son, the Father says to the Son, He says, ask of me and I'll give you the nations. When Jesus ascended, what did he say? He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey. There's even a warning in Psalm 2 to the kings. It says to the kings, O kings, be wise. Obey the Son or you'll perish when his wrath is kindled. The promise of the Messiah is not a novelty in history. Jesus didn't come and everyone said, oh, this is an amazing thing, plan B. Now, things didn't go so well for the Father in the Old Testament, so now we have plan B. That's not Paul's gospel. Every, this is what's so compelling to me about Jesus. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I heard the gospel later on in life. Wasn't raised by Christians, didn't know the story. And one of the most compelling things to me about Christ and the gospel is that this is not a novelty. Every detail necessary to know Jesus, every detail, as Savior and as Lord, is written for us in the Old Testament long before Jesus comes. The who, the what, the where, the why, the when, the how, everything is in the Old Testament. I was sitting down with a Jewish girl while I worked as a uh, chaplain, a pastor at a hospital, four years, full-time, saw the greatest messes I could ever imagine, the most horrific stories all the time, every day in front of me, the most broken of all of life, the greatest display of depravity and sin in front of me every single day, back to back, stacked on top of each other. There's a Jewish girl that came in, she's a daughter of uh, parents who were immigrants, they were in the Israeli army, Jews, devout Jews. She comes into me and she says, Pastor Jeff, I'm not a Christian, and I don't want to hear really about Jesus. I'm Jewish, and uh, I just want to ask you some questions. And so I started to talk to her, and then she finally says, okay, tell me about Jesus. <laughs> okay, all right. And, uh, she's, and so I said, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll make a deal with you. I will tell you about Jesus, and I will do something. I will only use the text of Scripture that you and I agree with. I won't even touch the New Testament. We will just stay in the Torah and the Tanakh, and we will just stay there. We won't even touch the New Testament. Deal? She says, Doubt that's possible, but okay, fair. So we spent about two weeks together in the scriptures of the Old Testament while she's in this hospital getting better. And after two weeks of going into texts like Isaiah 9, 6, that God is coming as a son and as a child. El Gibor is coming, the father of eternity. Who's the only eternal one? Well, God is the only eternal one. That eternal one is coming as a son and as a child, according to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 53, he'd be pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, that he was going to be counted among the rebels, that he would justify the many because he would bear their iniquities. Psalm chapter 2, the entire passion of the Messiah, his hands and feet pierced in the text, his heart like wax melted within him, that they would wag their heads at him. And that's all what happened in the text, Micah 5, 2, that God was coming to Bethlehem. The actual timing in Daniel chapter 9 says the Messiah is going to come and be cut off. That's to die a violent death, and then the second temple is going to be destroyed. You got bookends. Brothers and sisters, you got a bookend in prophecy. The when of the Messiah, he's coming to be cut off, and then the second temple is going to be destroyed. And I would ask her, when was the temple destroyed? Well, it was destroyed first century, right, 70 AD. So if Jesus isn't the Messiah, who is? So she calls her mom up. 
And she says, Mom, I think I'm starting to believe in Jesus. And her mom says, no, no, we don't do that. We don't believe in Jesus. We're Jews. Shalom. (laughs) We don't believe in Jesus. And she says, Mom, is there any good reason, any good reason to believe that Jesus is not Messiah, Mashiach? Is he, what, what, why? Why, why do we believe he's not the Messiah? Is there any good reason to not believe it? And she told me that her mom was silent on the phone for like 30 seconds. Nothing. And she says, Mom, is there any good reason not to believe in him as Messiah? And her mom said, no. Every detail about this Messiah in the Old Testament, God has a plan of history. Listen, you and I have something that is compelling the world doesn't have. Our kids are being taught today in school, secular education and in college, that they are the descendants of fish. That we are just stardust bing banging on the surface of the cosmos in a universe that's ungoverned, that does not care. All that is above us is sky. No justice ahead of us. We live, we die, and we're gone. We're absolutely gone when we die. That's what the world is telling our children today. That the universe is just time and chance acting on matter. No governing anything. No personal order. And you and I have a story the true story of the true and living God who sustains everything. Jesus who carries the universe along to its intended destination. God has a plan of history and it is, brothers and sisters, a symphony. It is a symphony. And the amazing thing is, is this symphony plays together. You need to hear it all together. And it's God's story in history. It's his story. And Jesus comes as planned and on time to do what? To reconcile people to God. That's the story. Jesus doesn't come to make your life simply better. Jesus didn't come to simply give a drink of water to somebody. Jesus did not come just for social justice, although that's a result of the gospel. Amen? But he came to reconcile people to God. And when Jesus came into his ministry, he said, repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. The message of the gospel always came with a call to repentance and faith, not a try Jesus. Perhaps the world thinks our message is irrelevant because it is irrelevant. When we give them the idea that Jesus is something you simply add to your story. Jesus bids us to come and die. And I like to think that the gospel is still good news. I like to think that God is still mighty to save. I like to think that God still raises the dead. And I want to ask the question, if we are losing at this point in history, what is wrong? Is it God or is it us? We have to ask that question and we have to be deadly serious about it. The good news of God always came. Read the book of Acts. I challenge you to read Acts. I want to ask you to read Acts. Do it. If you're going to go into ministry, if you believe you're called by God to serve Jesus and to lay your life down for the sake of the gospel and others, I want you to read the book of Acts. And I want to ask you, I want to ask you this question. I want to ask you if our typical model of evangelism and outreach to the world even resembles the book of Acts. The book of Acts, you have the confident, bold gospel being proclaimed in every place possible. And it's always with a call to repentance and faith repentance and faith and it was such a clear message that there's accusations being made to the christians and what is it in acts when peter's preaching what is the charge against the early christians what is it they're saying you're filling jerusalem up with this teaching and i have to ask the question is that happening in phoenix do people surrounding our churches challenge us as christians and say to us you're filling this city up with this teaching The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, in Acts 9, as soon as he comes to Christ, he says in Galatians that he persecuted the church, he tried to destroy it. We know that he's guilty of killing at least one Christian, throwing others in jail, and as soon as Jesus knocks him off his high horse, as soon as he turns to Christ, it says, read the text, Acts chapter 9, immediately, immediately he goes to Damascus and he goes to the synagogues and it says that he argued with the Jews proving that Jesus was the Messiah and here's the deal 
He goes into a religious context. How offensive. <laughs> Paul, you shouldn't be so controversial. You shouldn't just try to be antagonistic. But Paul goes into Damascus and he goes into the synagogues and he proclaims Christ and he starts being the kind of Christian that actually argues with others for the, for the faith. Tells the truth in a sense that he's bold and confident and he's willing to take the hits. And you got to look at Acts 9. What's the result? What's the result of bold proclamation of the gospel that comes into the culture and sacrifices everything for the sake of love for the other person? What's the result? It says, ready? Some people wanted to kill him. The church had peace. It was built up. And it says it was being multiplied. People have said to me, Jeff, I don't know if, it, over the years, you shouldn't go to those hard places. You shouldn't go to the Mormon temple where there's 100,000 people present. You shouldn't go to the Jehovah's Witnesses where they're at. You shouldn't hold public debates with atheists. You shouldn't go downtown and try to create relationships. That's not the way to do it. You hold barbecues. You have UFC fight nights. That's how you preach the gospel. And I want to say, show me that in the New Testament. I say a bold proclamation of the faith that gets in the face of the culture and sacrifices everything. Of course there's friendships. Of course there's barbecues. Of course. But that should be like breathing. That's like asking me, did you breathe today? Well, of course. But what about the other parts? What, a part of the, what about the part of the gospel proclamation that goes into the face of the culture, proclaims the gospel, and risks everything? I always say when people say to me, that's antagonistic. That's kind of, you know, it's kind of getting in the face. It's a little rough edge. I don't know if you should do that. You should sort of make friends for 10 years, and then maybe if you get a chance, tell them about Jesus. I say, well, you know, Paul, uh, people tried to kill him when he preached the gospel. Nobody's tried to kill me yet, so maybe I'm doing something wrong. Look in the book of Acts. You see a bold proclamation of what? Here's a story of the gospel. We are sinners against a holy and limitlessly powerful God. He is love and he is justice and he is good. And here's the story. He's good and I'm not. He is righteous and I am not. And the story of the gospel always came with a reminder of sin. Read Romans. There is none righteous, none who seeks for God. Their feet are swift to shed blood. The law is given, Paul says, to shut you up, that your mouth may be closed and he says in Romans chapter 3, read the text, he says, By the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. That proclamation comes, a reminder of God and his goodness and holiness, a reminder of our sin, and in the story of Messiah, God became man. Let me say that to you again, because that's a shouting moment. God became man. The infinite took on finite. The limitless became man, was dependent upon his mother, he had pimples, stomach aches, scratched his knee, was hungry, was homeless. He endured all the suffering that you and I have tasted. There's nothing you can give to Jesus by way of complaint that he hasn't touched, that he doesn't know better than you. Everything in our experience he knows, but not just suffering among us, but suffering and dying for sinners. The Messiah was to come to redeem sinners. It is about our sin against a holy God. That's the story. We're not sick. And as soon as we start telling the world that story, that we're not just sick, the Bible says we are dead in our sins and trespasses. Paul does not pull punches in Romans. Read the first three chapters. The message comes with our sin and the holiness of God and the story of Messiah who took on flesh, perfectly obeyed the law of God in the place of sinners, died for sinners, was crucified, was buried and rose again, and is ascended. And here's the message. The call, repent and believe the gospel. Turn from sin to trust in this Messiah. The call to turn from sin to come and fall on him, to abandon self-righteousness, to abandon all my sin, and to come and to embrace Jesus and hide in him. The message of the gospel did not come in a way that could actually express to somebody that this is something you try out, and maybe that is where we fail. I want you to consider for a second in the proclamation of the gospel to turn it from your sin, to trust in Christ, to flee sin and self-righteousness, to fall on him and put your faith in him for forgiveness and salvation, to be credited with his righteousness, 
to be declared righteous by faith apart from works of law in this Messiah who died, was buried, and rose again. That message came out always consistent, repent and believe, repent and believe. And listen closely. In Romans chapter 1, I want you to catch this next test. Romans 1, 16, it says this, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Let me say it to you again. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. You need to hear it again. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's not your personality, Christian. It's not your barbecue. It's not your UFC fight night. It's not the friendship you develop over five years with a person. It is the gospel. That is the power of God for salvation. It's not my unique flavor and my taste in music. It's not creating a clique that looks fun for others to join. This is the message of the gospel. Repentance and faith be reconciled to God through this Messiah. And that is what we're missing. A call, of course, to be loving and kind and friendship and uh, do everything we can to display the love of God in the world. But we tell the world the message. He died for sinners, was buried and rose again, and he bids you to come and turn and trust in him. Listen to how Jesus preached the gospel when he would call people to come to him. Imagine it for a second in our context. I want to just be transparent with you guys. Think about it for a second. Think think about it. (laughs) Thousands of people show up to church one day, right? Mega church situation, right? Thousands of people could show up one day. What do we do as Christians in our culture? What do we do? Everything we can to keep them. Everything we can to keep them. I'm not indicting any one church. I'm saying we soften our message. We soften the blow for the sake of numbers. Luke 14, Jesus has thousands of people in front of him. Think about it for a second. He has massive crowds. The movement looks like, hey, it's finally gaining some headway. This is finally a comforting moment for us. We actually have some followers now. Lots of people hanging out with Jesus. And Jesus in Luke chapter 14 does something astonishing. Read it in your text, Luke 14, 25. He says, now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, it is not hate his father, his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Where is that message today? Brothers and sisters, we ask ourselves the questions. Why, why are we seen as irrelevant today in our culture? Why does the world see us as just an oddity of the past? Where's our message? Do I, sound, do I even sound like Jesus? I saw a guy at Starbucks once. I'm sitting down. Dude comes in. Hippie dude. <laughs> That's why I like him. I'd probably hang out with him. He's like, you know... I must, I don't know if he was like high on Jesus or something else, but he was definitely high. He was floating. <laughs> Walks by a guy at a table, and, you know, I just see this whole thing go down. He's like, dude, man, dude, like, man, Jesus loves you, man. He just loves you, man. God just wants, wants to wrap his arms around you and just love on you, man. He loves you. That's the gospel, man. He just loves you, man. And I was like, <laughs> Whew. true God is love, Yes. And he is infinitely loving, and I don't think I can even comprehend it. But I have to ask the question, if, the, if God loves the person just as he is, what's the need for Jesus? And I want to ask the question, when Jesus proclaimed the gospel, who was love incarnate, did he proclaim the gospel in a way where he did not confront somebody where they were at and tell them that you are over here and you need to come over here? And Jesus in Luke 14 actually does some damage. Think about it. Jesus would fail every single seminary course on evangelism that's out there. Every single one. Thousands of followers. We'd be like, collect them. Let's go. Let's give them some chocolate milk and some cotton candy. What do we got to do? Keep them in here, right? 
And Jesus turns around and says to them, all right, thousands of followers, they're like, yes, yes, finally, we're growing. And Jesus says, if you don't hate father, mother, sister, brother, wife, even your own life, if you don't come to die, don't come. Come die and rise again. Or don't come. Jesus is the uh, master of the church shrinkage movement. And they leave. Jesus is left with 12 disciples. He turned every single one away. And he turns to those that are left and he says to them, do you also want to leave? And what's their answer? They say, where where are we going to go? Listen, you have the words of eternal life. They understood. The crowd that left did not understand that this was about life and peace with God. The disciples knew it. The crowd did not. That's why they left. And when we proclaim the gospel, do we proclaim the gospel the way that Jesus did, the way that Paul did, the way the apostles did, where they told people, this is about dying and rising again. This is about you being united to this Messiah, God as man, dead for sinners, buried and risen again, ascended and seated, putting his enemies under his feet. Repent and believe the gospel, the good news of God, the good news of his kingdom. Be reconciled to God. Come and die. That was the consistent message of Jesus and the apostles. Read Romans 6 after Paul declares that by the deeds of the law, Romans 3.28, there shall no flesh be justified in his eyes. He then moves on after grace and grace and God crediting to us righteousness that's not our own through faith and God covering our sins, Romans 4, and never counting them against us again. In Romans 6, Paul says this, what should we say then? Should we continue in sins that grace may increase? His answer is this, God forbid, how shall we who died to sin continue to live in it? Jesus talked about coming to die. Paul talked about a death occurring in your life and mine when we came to Christ. And if we don't get back to that message of the gospel, we lose. And we ask why the culture is decaying around us. Jesus says, you are the salt. You are the light. Salt, listen, is a preservative. It preserves. We have in our culture today, in the last 40 years, 55 million babies dead. 55 million. You can't even say that and make sense of it. 55 million, 3,000 babies dead a day in our country, in our country, in our culture. These abortion mills around you and around me. Where's our salt? Where's our light? If we're not the salt, if we're not light to the world, then there isn't any salt, there isn't any light. Jesus says, you are the city on the hill. Nobody else takes up the reins for us here, guys. It's us. And the problem is, We're too afraid to die. Listen, I'm going to challenge you with this. This might hurt your feelings. This might sting a little bit. But let me just challenge you with something. If you don't come into this to die, don't come. You're only hurting us. You're you're not helping. We don't need people to fill shoes. We don't need people to get a check. We don't need people to fill a spot on a stage. We need people who are ready to live lives of missionary sacrifice and to die for the sake of the gospel and the world and love for others. Walter Martin once said this. He says, you have to be willing to be hated by the very people you love and are trying to reach. And I think I ask the question of us today as leaders. I'm in this with us. We are a body together. I am not jabbing and talking down to any of us. We are in this together But this is the fault of the church. We have to ask the question, if we are not living lives of missionary sacrifice, we have to ask the question, whether or not we've actually died or not. Have I been raised up with Christ or not? Or do I seek my life as most important now? Is my treasure truly in heaven or is it here in in the coolest stuff, in the coolest edgy programs? Is it in the house, in the car, in a pretty smooth and easy life? Am I in love with comfort and being well-received? Where's your idol? Where's your idol? Paul said, 
Christ and Him crucified. That's it. That's the essence of our message. We proclaim the truth of the gospel. It's not just about serving others. It's not just about the drink of water. It's not just about that. It's about repentance and faith. It's about reconciliation with God. And if we don't get back to that message, then we have lost our culture. I pray that Pastor Jeff has blessed you in the same way that he's blessed me. I'll tell you, what you see when you listen to his passion and you understand that his purposes are coming out of a pursuit for the purity of God lived out. I pray that you'll see, here again, Leviticus 11 through 15. Oh, if you want to focus in on the particulars and the details and ask questions about food and menstrual cycles and leprosy and skin ointments and all that, you can do it, but that's not the point. The point is to prepare you and me to live under the standards of God, to recognize that faithful obedience is our blessing, it's our witness, it's the test of who we really are. It's God's standards. It's that which our Savior has set forth and told us to carry forward. Amen. You see, it's our faithful obedience to God's word, God's will and God's way that will serve as our greatest work, as our greatest witness, and it will be the description of genuine worship. That's what we have to offer. Any honest pursuit of God's holiness will be met with a passionate pursuit of living out the holiness that is described fundamentally by living under the authority of God's word, in the pursuit of God's will, under the restraints and guidelines of God's way. We allow the word of God to serve as our guardrails, and we beg the spirit of God to lead us and guide us. That's the truth. That's what we see being established here in Leviticus 11 through 15. My prayer is that while this may not be what you would have expected to come out of a study of this passage, that in principle you will see the wisdom here in the genius of God's grace. That you'll see that in this we have the way of God, demonstrating the wisdom of God, paving the way for our worship of God, and that all together it serves as the warning, again, that God's holiness describes God's way and declares God's warning. Now let me leave you with three thoughts that I think encapsulate this passage again. And it's a principled-based application, but it's a biblical-based application. Note here that God gives us his truth, God gives us his test, and God gives us his time. Amen. That when you come to understand the purpose of God laying out the details that bring us to the fork in the road, to ask the question, will we faithfully obey, yes or no? Not 98%, not 99%, but 100%. Will we say, yes, Lord, and surrender to victory in Christ? We see here that he's given us his truth so that we will realize what we need to know. That God is holy and we are not. And that we can't make ourselves holy enough for heaven. Therefore, he created the sacrificial atoning system. And in the Old Testament, he provided the sacrifices and praise God in Christ. In the New Testament, he supplied and is the capital S sacrifice. Listen, the truth is you must be born again and Jesus is the only way. You must repent and believe. This is what he has told us. And he made it clear that it would be in the context of spiritual warfare. Ephesians 10 and following says he's going to give you and me his armor to wear because the battle is going to be real. That's biblical. Read Matthew chapter 7. We're warned about those who appear to be sheep, but they're ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. We're told to strive to get through the narrow gate. We're warned of those who will at one point say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these things for you? And Jesus is going to say, away from me, you evildoers. That's the truth. He also gives us the test. And we've seen this throughout Leviticus. 
we watch two young priests be dropped and consumed by fire. We've seen that God is testing his people and he's making it clear. If you reject his way, you cannot come into his presence. To reject his way is to embrace his wrath. That's what we see in John 3, 36. Those who believe in the Son have eternal life. Those who do not obey the Son do not have life, but instead the wrath of God abides on them. This is God's way. He taught it back in the Garden of Eden. He's carrying it through the Old Testament. It comes all the way through the Gospels and the letters that go out to the early church. This is God's way. The test is, are you going to give your life to Christ? He said, if you find your life here on earth, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life in Christ, then you will find it eternal. That's the test. Will you live a life worthy of the gospel? Again, like last week, we saw in 1 John 2, 6, those who claim to be in Christ must walk as Jesus walked. You heard Pastor Jeff Again, Luke 14, 27, if you will not pick up your cross daily and follow me, Jesus said, Jesus, you cannot be his disciple. This is the test. Faithful obedience is the truth and it's the test. And praise God, he's given us time for those who don't yet know the truth or those who have not yet passed the test. And that's the essence of his grace and his love as well, showing that this is a clear sharing of the truth with an understanding that there will be a test. Nobody's going to be shocked, I pray, on Judgment Day that here is this message, that you'll come to understand that he is coming soon. He's made that clear in his word, that he's coming soon, which means that right now he's either calling or sending everyone. He's coming and there will be closure. So between now and his coming back, he's calling or sending every single human being. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and the other things that you seem to think you need and want, those will be given to you. But first comes him and your faithful obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, in this time that remains, pray that the Lord will give you a love for him and a love for others that you won't use the time trying to be served, but that you'll serve, right? That you'll embrace the Great Commission. That as Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so now I send you. That you're gonna receive my spirit for the express purpose of being my witness. As you heard, to the nations, locally, regionally, globally. That's why we, on this day, we celebrate the fact that as a small, humble people of God, he's chosen to use us in the eastern shore region of Maryland to the Baltimore Beltway, across the eastern shore, up the east coast, into Vermont, into the northeast kingdom of Vermont. And he's using us today as our sister Christine is in Kampala, Uganda, and going out to the villages that represent about a 50-mile radius in Kampala, Uganda. Yesterday, the students in the Indian Seminary in Kerala graduated and have gone out to their villages. We've been blessed to be able to pour in to them. We have people most of you don't even know about across China that have been touched by our commitment to faithful obedience. Now again, this is all of the Lord's grace and it's all for his glory. But understand, it's a commitment to faithful obedience that opens up the door for us to see him do the miraculous, to watch him do his mission through the ministry that is our people, all for his glory. And so perhaps now you'll understand why I leave you with another verse that connects us to Hebrews showing the relationship between Leviticus and Hebrews, but more importantly, between the children of God and Almighty God. It's Hebrews 11:24. Here in the great hall of fame of faith, Hebrews 11, God's word says, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds. Let us consider how to stir one another up to holy, righteous, 
faithfully obedient gospel works. That's the message. I pray that you see the connection between Leviticus 11 through 15 and the great commandments and the great commission of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. May God get all the glory. Lord, I ask you now as we once again offer an invitation to come to the altar, that those who don't yet know you will come for the first time, and those that do know you will come back for calibration and inspiration. I thank you for the clarity that you've given us in your word to understand that your will and your ways matter. Let us go forward with your message and your methods as we live on your mission. And thank you for the call. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Washed us white as snow. 